Social Zoom Factor, episode 212. Driving results in business these days takes something special. It's a combination of the right info and the right energy. Pam Moore has both and is here to help you avoid the pitfalls and guide your business and life by leveraging and integrating social media, powerful branding, and digital marketing. Welcome to Social Zoom Factor. Now it's time to live life zoomed. Are you ready to take your new idea to fruition? One of the first things you need to do is get your business online. Our partner HostGator can take you from zero to turbo fast. Download their Get Online the Easy Way ebook and receive a coupon code for 30% off any new hosting package. Simply visit socialzoomfactor.com slash hostgator easy or simply text hostgator to 33444. Hey there, Zoomers, and welcome to Social Zoom Factor. This is your host, Pam Moore. All right, today you are in for a special surprise. Why, you ask? Well, we have a guest by the name of Jason Keith. I'm sure you've seen him around the digital social web. He is the founder and CEO of Social Fresh. So they host events both on the East Coast and the West Coast every year. And today we are lucky because he just completed in collaboration with Simply Measured and the Firebrand Group, my buddy Jeremy Goldman over there, they surveyed 551 digital marketers to understand what their behaviors are in regard to social media. Where are they investing? Where are they seeing ROI? Where are they advertising? How are they hiring? How are they spending their marketing budgets? How are they utilizing the resources that they have to bring the highest possible ROI in everything that they are doing. That is what we're going to talk about today. And I know many of you like to have access to some of this data as we are talking through the details. So please go download the report. Go to socialzoomfactor.com slash future and you can download Jason and Social Fresh's report that we are going to be talking about on this podcast episode today. And I also want to let you know, for the upcoming event in Orlando, I will also be conducting a 90-minute workshop on advanced Pinterest strategies. And we'll be digging in to strategies and tactics around the advertising platform, content strategies, measurement that will help you generate real leads and real business profits utilizing Pinterest. So if you would like to join us for this event, please go to socialzoomfactor.com slash socialfresh and you will be able to save an immediate $100 on your ticket because I will be there, a lot of your friends will be there, and it's going to be a great time of learning and collaboration. So go to socialzoomfactor.com slash socialfresh. Without any further ado, let's bring on Jason and get this conversation started. Hello there, Jason Keith. How's it Good going morning. today? Doing great. Doing great. How are you? I am doing good. It's it's very nice to talk with you. Today, we're talking about the future of marketing. And I know you have been up to some really incredible things in regard to research and a special event you have coming up. So I'd love you to share with us uh, what you're up to and a little bit about yourself, if you can. Sure. Uh, I am the CEO of Social Fresh Conference. Um and uh, we were talking online the other day about the, our, our first original research that we came out this year, the future of social media marketing. Um, we're really excited about that. I would love to discuss it. And it really reflects well what we do as a business, which is our conference, uh, Social Fresh. So we bring together a lot of uh, social marketers, um, content marketers every year, kind of on the leading edge of the industry, where the industry is headed, what the future of social media marketing is, uh, talking about things like Snapchat and live streaming and Instagram video ads and all that great stuff. And uh, we're going to even have Pam Moore at the conference this year helping us out with a little bit of content. And it really aligns well with our report and kind of where the industry is headed and, and people can kind of check in 
with where, what their peers are doing and what's working really well with, for them. Absolutely. And I know that I think that's something that's really unique about the Social Fresh event is that it's a, it's one stage, correct? Other than the workshops. So it's it's one stage. Yeah, we do one stage, one track. So you know, we have pre-conference workshops, which allow more a deeper dive and people can pick and choose those. Uh, but for you know most of our content, you know 95% of the content on the stage, it's one track. Everybody has the same experience. So yeah. when you're having those amazing hallway conversations or evening reception conversations, you've all seen the same speakers. You've all heard the same topics. We curate so you don't have to curate, so you don't have to miss anything. And it, it really improves the community nature of the event, which I think is where, you know, just as much of the education happens. Absolutely. I think I was in Sweden last year. The last two years I was out of town and I remember watching people live streaming some of the event. I remember seeing Jay Bear and um, the woman, I forgot her name from Dunkin' Donuts. Yes, Jessica. Yes. And I just remember watching and really wishing I was there. And, and seeing, you know, and as a, a fellow entrepreneur, it's just always inspiring for me to see people following their dreams and where you've taken it, you know, since oh, 10, 2010. So I think that's, that's very nice. That's great. So yeah. now tell me where I, I want to dig into this report that you are, you just launched. And I would like to learn more about even how you went about the report and who you partnered with to do it, that type yeah. of thing and kind of what drove it. Yeah, so we partnered with Firebrand Group, which is an agency we work with, a really sharp agency in New York City. Um, and uh, Jeremy Goldman, who's their CEO, we're actually speaking at the conference this year. Love him. Um, yeah, Jeremy's great. Love him. He's going to be talking about video and how it pertains to social marketing. So that will be really mm-hmm. good. And then we also partnered with Simply Measured, who is a great company. Love working with them on the yes. analytics side. Um they will also be at the conference this year. Of course, we're integrating everything very well. And uh, they were really crucial in helping you know, get the right people into the report. So we had 551 social marketers take the report, mostly US-based, mostly brand side, mostly decision makers, mm-hmm. although we wanted to make sure it represented B2B and B2C, small business and large business, a wide range of industries. And it, it helped having access to their networks in addition to having access to the amazing Social Fresh audience. And we also did some one-on-one emails with LinkedIn research to try to hit the kind of uh, buckets that we may be missing a little bit. Mm-hmm. So we really had a well-rounded audience and um, the, the survey results, I think, reflect that really well. And where can people get this report? Let's give them that link right now and then sure. we can do it at the end because I know a lot of our audience likes uh, to have things tangible as we're talking through the data. Yeah, they can download it, print it out, and follow along. Okay. <laughs> so it's at socialfresh.com slash future. Um, that's the free report. There's also a um, Paygate uh, version of the report if you really want to get deep into it. But it's uh, it's the free version has tons of tons of data, and we can talk about all that today. And I think Perfect. it's a really good touchstone for anyone that's has a budget or investment or time investment in social marketing for their business. Absolutely. And even just a sanity check. So let's go ahead and dig in. So you did 551, uh, you had 551 respondents. I'm looking at the report right now. There was 64% were brand, 30% agency, and then 6% vendor, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So good. I think that's a good coverage. And then top industries, you want to talk about that a little bit? Just any blaring um, comments you have on that? Not really. I mean, okay. you know, we did get uh, a little bit of agency folks, but when we took that out, you know, it, it reflected some of the same industries that we see mm-hmm. um, at our conferences and through our online training. You know, mm-hmm. some of the more interesting ones that I always uh, find are unique challenges for us, and, and we do really well at, at kind of addressing are the nonprofits who invest heavily in social media. I think the hospitality industry and entertainment industry mm-hmm. is another huge one, uh, retail. Uh, and we also see um, increasingly kind of uh, regulated industries in using social media mm-hmm. in a, to a large degree. So when I talk about that, I think about finance and healthcare and those types of companies. And we saw those uh, reflected in the in the respondents as well. It's funny. We I've always in my career tended to work for a lot of unsexy brands. We work with sexy brands too, but um, I think there's so much opportunity in some of the the unsexy industries right now with manufacturing, oh, sure. right? Yeah. And, and, and regulated. I think that's a great point because they're just now to the point where they're saying, okay, this is safe. <laughs> you know, it's yes, the, the, it's the laws of adoption and they're saying, okay, some of these things are safe. Now we're ready to start testing. Yeah, it. And that's, and that's why I started social fresh to begin with, you know, I didn't intend this to become a company, but I did the first conference back in 2009. Um, and this is our 18th conference coming up, but 
we started it because I was doing, I was on the agency side. I was kind of the social media lead person for a lot of these projects and we would pitch them and pitch them and pitch them because everyone was interested, Mm -hmm. but they wouldn't pull the trigger because they didn't trust it. There was an education gap there that caused them not to trust social media. And I think you're right. We have come full circle. People do trust it. And now it's about how do I use it? Not whether we should or not. Yeah. And if you think about some of those industries, uh, the players who have actually went a little slower, they, of course, aren't early adopters. So they're going to have it a lot easier as they start to onboard, right? And they're learning yes, from everybody sure. ahead of them. And so the risk is lower. But uh, it's I think it's going to be interesting to see over the next couple of years as some of these new, some of the laggards uh, start to really embrace this. I, I honestly think some of them are probably going to leapfrog um, some of the others yeah. who maybe were even in the forefront. I think it's going to Yeah, be- I think healthcare is a great example of that because they mm-hmm. have budget. Mm -hmm. Um, and they move slowly and methodically usually, but when they move, they move, uh, you know, very surely if they, if they decide to adopt, um, a new technology or a new marketing direction, they, they do it very well and they could definitely leapfrog some companies. I think that's a great example. Yeah. And a lot of them, they understand branding, right? They understand branding and their customer and messaging some of the, the business marketing one-on-one things that we see so many brands forgetting these days. Oh yeah, definitely. All right. So let's shift gears a little bit now and let's talk about the data that came from the report and around goals. Cause I thought that was really interesting looking at what the top goal is uh, for respondents being awareness versus lead generation. And I know this is near and dear to your heart too. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's a good and bad sign in, in a couple of ways. And you know, the way to position it is it's a huge opportunity for improvement, I think. So we asked people, what their top two social media goals were because most people, most companies I think have two that they're looking for. Um, and those come from different directions. They might be coming from the boss. They might be coming from the, uh, the comms team might be coming from your CMO, whatever, but awareness was number one at 76%. So three out of four companies have awareness as one of their top social media goals, which is probably not the smartest decision because awareness is not the low hanging fruit. Really what, what we advise and what, you know, industry leaders advise is to go after your low hanging fruit, which is, uh, at Social Fresh, we say focus on three audiences first when you do your social media. Number one, your customers. Number mm-hmm. two, your your best leads, those that are your best potential customers. And number three, your fans or your kind of stakeholders, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and those are the people that might be your best uh, um, word of mouth opportunities. So, and those have overlap, and we say in that order. Uh, so, for your customers, you want to look at customer loyalty. You want to look at customer service as your big goals, and then lead gen and sales as goals as well uh, in those categories. Awareness you can do with social media. You can spread awareness through social media. It's a great opportunity to do that. But to do that on scale costs money and time and budget. And most social media departments are small. Most of them are uh, under budget, even though those budgets are growing very rapidly. Um, And most of them are constrained on time. So to focus on awareness is really diluting your opportunity for success. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think focus on those three goal on those three audiences first, and on uh, customer focused and lead focused and sales focused goals first. And if you get that locked in, and you have budget, and you have time, and you have the personnel, then focus on awareness of, you know, your brand to a new audience or a new product to existing audiences, and you know, use that to your advantage. But I think that should be the kind of last step, and it looks like it's the first step for a lot of folks or close to it. Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of times it's just because it's the easy thing to do. And your report digs into that as well, you know, stating that, and I completely agree, and that many times people will choose awareness just because they don't know how to measure. They don't know where their leads come from half the time. Or Yes, this is true. Or Measuring's hard. I mean, it is. You know, there's so many different inputs and platforms you're on. And, and, you know, if you're on a podcast, how do you measure the impact of that podcast? If you mm-hmm do a live stream? How do you measure that? There's so many things that are new and hard to measure, but you still have to try. You have to at least have a simple system for it. And I think, I think you're right. This awareness goal, it's driven by higher ups, you know, CEOs and CMOs can understand likes and followers and Mm -hmm. retweets and shares much more easily than they can understand customer loyalty numbers or lead generation numbers. Right. So Mm -hmm. Because it's uh, it's a little bit driven by that, I think, and it's a little bit driven just be- because all these numbers are so public and available. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, it was, I'm not going to go in detail, but there was a, one of the last companies I worked for, the CEO was, before I became an entrepreneur, was literally, I mean, begging every day, like, we need a viral video, right? And um, I think that there's still some of, 
some of that out there where they, yes. right. <laughs> where they will see and they will see their competitors and they see, Oh, well, you know, my comp- competitor A, B or C is just rocking it. Like every time I put on my Facebook um, or I pull up any type of stream on LinkedIn, you know, all I'm seeing is them. So then that CEO ends up driving awareness or driving a random act of, you know, advertising on whatever platform that is instead of having a sound strategy and platform, form that's going to help you set your goals and achieve your goals and measure, you know, your progress. Yeah. The, the, we want a viral video problem still exists for sure. Mm -hmm. I tell people you can have a viral video. It costs you a quarter million dollars. (laughs) I know the people to send you to or the people to hire. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's the only way you can guarantee it really. I mean, unless you have someone that's amazing and been doing video work and viral video success, uh, you know, for 10 years of their career, it's just not viable. It's rolling the dice. Right. Um, Whereas investing in your customers in social media is not really in the dice. It's very proven and successful and a great strategy, but, and repeatable. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that is the perfect example. And it, it, you know, it's the cool factor. Everyone wants to have that big splash, uh, mm-hmm. but it's, it's much more sound to focus on these smaller audiences that, that actually produce steady revenue for a business. Right. Right. And it's, you know, I think it's, it's going to be a constant, uh, struggle for many agencies. And even I think people working with inside of brands to manage the expectations of, of goal setting. Yeah, and it's a challenge. yeah, I, I don't see it going away. I mean, because no matter, no matter the size of the client we work with, whether it's a big, huge brand or it's a, you know, teeny tiny, they have the same problems. And oftentimes what we see is some of the smaller, you know, SMB type companies and even entrepreneurs, they can be more agile, right? They can set up the platform and invest yeah. in a lower end uh, measure, measurement platform that's not going to cost them ten to $100,000 a month. Yes, and- <laughs> agreed. And, you know, there, there are companies that need the larger mm-hmm. measurement platforms yeah. and, and it's great that those exist, but I think, you know, the, one of the examples that I like to show people if I if I'm in the room when those conversations happen and they want to scale up to something big and splashy versus investing in their customer and potential customers is is actually just looking at one customer at a time and whether it's a bad social media experience that you can show them how that could have been improved or whether it's just an interview with an existing customer and investing in that person as a as a mm-hmm. human and understanding how they relate to the to the brand and how uh, small interactions can take that person from uh, just a one-time customer to a word of mouth machine for the business. So I think getting down Absolutely. to a micro level, uh, one, one audience member at a time, mm-hmm. uh, can help that kind of realization a little bit sometimes. Absolutely. And just digging into, you know, the, the native, even the native insights that are within the application, you know, knowing yeah, it's completely. so simple data points of knowing on Facebook, when is your customer online? There's a fitness brand we were doing some work with and the number one time that content such as quotes for fitness is shared is first thing in the morning. Okay. But yeah. you you need to know that. Okay. That is when they are going to have the chance, you know, to go the most semi-viral, but the highest time that they are online, the tar- their target audience was late at night, but we had priorities for both of those windows of time. Right. But it yeah. had different objectives. And although it was a very small amount of people that were on at six in the morning, those people were more likely to share that content because they were looking for inspiration and then their audience was looking for inspiration for them. Yeah. So that was a great goal for awareness right during that time of day. And then the lead generation was hap- will happen at different points of the day. And it's knowing to your point, what you keep going back to is knowing who your audience is and what are they doing? Who are they? You know, how? How old are they? Uh, where do they live? What job do they have? How many kids do they have? And what are they doing at six in the morning, 12 noon and three in the afternoon? Yeah, completely. And I I mean, I would categorize, you know, another problem here is awareness is like an ambiguous word that people can use in many ways. And it's accurate in many ways and confusing. But, you know, those those morning posts where people kind of need a start to their day and that and that fitness company is giving them better inspiration mm-hmm. and a, an opportunity to really uh cement that idea and, and get a better start to their day, you know, that's, in my opinion, that's, if that's either a customer, a potential customer yes. or it's a stakeholder, right? Absolutely. It's people who are already connected to your business yes. and that interaction is increasing their, their, uh, their bond with the business. It's increasing their engagement, um, and making them a better either customer, potential customer or word of mouth opportunity. So I think, you Absolutely. know, there's awareness that you could describe that, but to me, that's not awareness that that's a smaller audience that you're investing in 
yeah. uh, with good content and good understanding of, of how they relate to your company. Absolutely. Good. Very good point. And that clarifies it a little bit, too. And I think the other thing is, even if you dig a little deeper to that example, uh, then you even look at that that potential customer, that is their a, a great target for them because that person is getting up at six in the morning, right? Yes. Uh, and they that that's they want that audience that's committed, right? To to yeah. get to getting into that gym. And so if they need that quote of inspiration, you know, that may help them make that decision exactly to Yeah, and point. they may never be a customer. They may have a home gym or something, yeah. but if they're sharing your content and sharing it with their community, that community might be customers. Yeah. I think more businesses should be aware of those non-customer audience member, what I call stakeholders, because um, that can be huge word of mouth opportunities. For us, it's speakers. Like a lot of mm -hmm. speakers, you know, we have speakers that speak at Social Fresh and then pay to come back to the conference the next year, which we're really lucky to have. Mm -hmm. But even if they're not able to do that because they're too busy or it doesn't make sense for their business, um, they are still an important audience for us because their audiences are our customers. So it's important for us to keep them uh, close to the business as mm -hmm. stakeholders, even mm -hmm. if they're not customers or leads. Absolutely. And I can see that, you know, even though I haven't been <laughs> as connected to you as I, I wish I would have the last couple of years, it's good that we're getting reconnected. Um, I can see that even from the outside looking in. I mean, it's really easy to tell Jason and kudos to you and your team that you have truly invested in relationships. And like you can tell even watching live stream video at your event and the, you know, if you follow the hashtag and you see um, people sharing their Instagram photos and their other videos, you can tell and you, you have proof points of the community you've invested in. Right? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, and that's why I'm back. You know, that's why we're here working <laughs> together. Right. Because I was like sure. the last couple of years I'm missing it. And so, FOMO. you know, that's kind of the dream. That's the nirvana of what I think, you know, and that's why I'm so excited about this event. And I think anyone listening to this podcast, you absolutely need to check out the event. If you can come and you need to, um, at minimum download this report and really follow Jason and, and what he's up to, because you, you understand the market, you understand what it takes to bring people to together. And, um, you understand it's not, um, we're not going to figure it out overnight, right? We're all better Thank together yeah. as we are as one. Jason, I know you and I could talk about goals and objectives for social media all day long, including brand awareness, lead gen and sales, but let's go ahead and let's transition now. And let's talk a bit about where are brands and businesses actually seeing ROI? Where are they investing? And what does the future look like for their investment in different types of content? But before we move there, we need to take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsors. Jason and I will be right back. The new year brings a time for evaluation, reflection, and planning. As an entrepreneur, you know your product, your target market, and how you are going to differentiate from competition to achieve success. One thing that often gets forgotten, though, is the online foundation. Do you have the right digital foundation to build a structurally sound business, or are you building on sand and hoping it will hold? Successful businesses are built on steady ground. You need a blueprint for success, curb appeal, and security. Our partner HostGator can help you do this and more. Download their Business Builder Kit, inclusive of nine steps for planning your website, 10 mistakes to avoid on your homepage, and three easy steps to protect your website from hackers. Simply go to socialzoomfactor.com slash host Gator Biz or text host Gator Biz to 33444. Again, that is socialzoomfactor.com slash host Gator Biz or text host Gator Biz to 33444. We could talk about this forever about the whole debate between awareness and all these other goals. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about now where are people um, seeing ROI? And I thought this is really interesting with where they're seeing ROI and then talking about where do they plan to invest. Yeah. Going yeah. Forward. So uh, we asked people which social networks produce the best ROI for them in the past year. And Facebook, as I mean, most questions in the in the survey, Facebook dominated. Right. So Facebook was um, the top answer by far. Uh, Ninety six percent of people selected Facebook as one of their top three ROI uh, options mm -hmm. when it comes to social networks. Then it was Twitter. Instagram, LinkedIn, um, and we also had uh, lower on the on the spectrum there. Pinterest, SlideShare, Snapchat. Mm -hmm. um, so you know the top four I think would not be a surprise: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, 
and LinkedIn and Instagram are very close. Twitter showed it up at 63 and a half percent. Um, but then when the biggest, I think, uh, move here that's important, and this is probably intuitive for a lot of folks, but maybe not for everyone, is that when we asked which social networks do you plan to invest in the most over the next year, it was pretty much the same results, except the one change being Instagram moved in front of Twitter to the number two spot. Yes, that was very interesting. Yeah, and we compare that to the user growth numbers. The user growth mm -hmm. uh, on Twitter has stagnated. Mm -hmm. um, it has flattened out. Um, don't get me wrong. I love Twitter. I think it's a good investment for people. I'm just talking about the numbers and right. the trends here. Uh, but Twitter's flattened out. Instagram surpassed Twitter when it comes to uh, monthly active users. And their growth line is still headed up. Twitter is still flat. Um, and I, you know, our big assumption here is that if it isn't already for your business or for the industry as a whole, uh, by the end of the year, Instagram will be the second most important social network for businesses. Um, that's because of the audience numbers. It's because of the ad platform that they have connected to Facebook mm -hmm. and the power of that engine. Uh, it's because of some of the moves they're making and the audience engagement there. I, I hear from a lot of folks that Instagram is the best engagement platform for them compared to Twitter, compared to Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, et cetera, that they're getting better engagement numbers there as well. So there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, mobile is another reason. I think it's one of the best mobile social networks uh, where people are spending more of their time. But it's interesting to see that Instagram surpasses Twitter when we talk about future investment. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the fact that uh, platforms like IFTT, if this, then that, um, enables i know for me i once have you ever used that tool where you can oh yeah yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. I, I i've definitely used that and uh you know we've we've used it several times over the years as it continues to improve yeah so that enabled me to start posting you know and even for some of our clients we post directly from instagram and then can push that natively to twitter so yeah. so much easier than we could ever do before well it's i think some of this is instagram's finally opening their api so mm -hmm. you can use you know sprout social or buffer yes. now or yes. you know many of these tools uh, I believe any even Hootsuite to post uh, to Instagram. I'm not 100 percent on Hootsuite, but it's it's opening up. The trend yes. line is going in the direction. It's it makes it easier. Better. It's to still use really it. painful to. Uh, and I think at the time at the their point though is they don't want people to auto schedule, right? I think that's correct. That's so I I have to believe in what they're doing and saying they're not wanting it to be a platform where everybody's just spamming it. And so for agencies, it's a pain, right? I wish we could do more auto scheduling on Instagram, but at the fact. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the well, it's, it's Instagram's job to yeah. improve the content on their platform. And yeah. it's the marketer's job to make it easier for businesses to use the platform for their business. So, Absolutely. I mean, I think they're doing the right thing. Instagram also wants us all to post DIY content and like artisanal images of, you know, the weather and art and I love that about Instagram. And I think they have to differentiate themselves from Facebook and they're doing a decent job at that. But businesses have to do what's right for them as well. Right. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's just a balance that has to be struck. So, you know, Instagram's always going to be on a certain side of that balance for sure. I agree. And I think, you know, from a personal branding perspective, um, people working either, you know, driving and owning their own companies or working inside a corporation, I think Instagram is an incredible personal branding tool. And um, you can give people a, a little bit of an insight into your life. And, yeah. and so I love helping people do that. I know for us, I don't personally use it for sales. It's mo it's mostly exactly what I just said. But we have landed a, quite a few really cool clients who have said, you know, the CEO has said, I followed you on Instagram for a long time. And oh, that's great. Yeah. And so it's, you know, it's one of the, as with any platform, it's how you use it and individualizing it for the person and the brand. Right. Yeah. And the back to your point on the ad platform. I mean, absolutely. You know, the fact that that's integrated with Facebook, I think that is only going to get better. I think it's going to yeah. be exciting. I mean, it's, it's a powerful engine, the Facebook ad platform, the, the amount of targeting you can do. Um, it's, it's very, um, clear that a lot of Instagram's growth on the business side is being driven by access to that mm -hmm. ad platform. Okay. So then anything else on the lower end we need to talk about there? So we have, uh, plan for investment. Number one being Facebook at 76%, then Instagram, 42, Twitter, 40%, LinkedIn, 35%, and then Pinterest and then Snapchat, bumped out slide share is what it looks like. So although slide share was next to last as far as ROI, yeah. then it slid out. Well, um, slide share is an interesting, yeah. you know, it's very niche, very, mm -hmm. very niche B2B kind of software focused services companies. 
Yep. Um, I think you're seeing Snapchat bump up there because people are very interested in Snapchat. Um, and they, uh, there are a few very key industries, especially just like there's a few key industries on Pinterest um, that are, are 100% going to invest in it. You know, mm-hmm. So that's TV brands, media companies, uh, for sure. Anybody that's heavily invested in a younger audience, like the Red Bulls of the world, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're they're going to be invested in that platform for sure moving forward. Yeah, and it's that's where I'm still struggling. Uh, the jury's still out for me on the B two B space for Snapchat. I'm yeah, I mean, I think it's similar to what you're talking about with Instagram, mm-hmm. um, where it's it's going to be harder. It's it's harder for B two B companies to tell a sexy story, to have you know fun, exciting video and images and multimedia. Mm-hmm on an Instagram or a Snapchat. Uh, but when you make it personal and you make it human and you yes. put a person first yes. on the account, um, you know, you can draw those lessons from personal branding. You can draw those lessons from one-on-one connections. I agree. And that's where those, those can make sense. Now I'm not saying by any means that Snapchat should be a, a key investment for B2B. I think there was a great article by Jeff Cohen over at Oracle where he talked about that and how, how he was, really confused by it as well. And there's not really a clear call to action for B2B companies on there. But for me, it's always human to human marketing. And if you think of it like that and you want to play around with Snapchat, you should do that. You should learn. I think at a minimum, it's, it's a great representation of, of the industry trends, which are video, uh, vertical video, multimedia, uh, kind of dark social, social messaging, Mm -hmm. um, and understanding that interaction because that's now bigger than social networking, um, number wise. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it represents a lot of these micro trends really well. And it's it's probably important for most marketers to at least experiment on the platform to understand. It. I agree. I think it's fun. I mean, I have we have a lot of fun on it. And for some of our clients, like in the B2C space, it works, right? We're getting ready to do some really fun things. Yeah. I mean, it works. And, you know, Pokemon's going to be another fun one. <laughs> Yes, Pokemon Go. We have like Pokemons out in front of our house. So I sit in my home office all the time, the days I work at home, and all day there's people pulling up. So it's really funny. It's a hoot. Okay. So, other things. What do you want to talk about next? So, we want to talk about time spent, kind of tying that to where are people investing as far as content and that type of thing? Sure. I mean, the the biggest. So, we ask people how much of your time spent has been on certain uh, tasks throughout Mm -hmm. the day. Um, and the biggest one was content. Yes. Um, and not only was content the biggest at like 18 and a half percent, content was, uh, heavily reflected in all the other ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, if you're publishing to social, you're publishing content. If you're advertising on social, you're advertising content, you know, so it's, it's the biggest time sink for, for folks in social, Mm -hmm. as well as kind of the first time sink that Mm -hmm. content development position. Um, so it kind of, starts starts everything rolling. So I think that's really important. And then that's also reflected when we talked about hiring. Um, we asked where people were planning to hire over the next year. Mm-hmm. And of the companies that are planning to hire, um, 60% are planning to hire a social media manager, which is what you would expect. Like it's the number one job title that's being hired right. as a social media manager or a community manager. Um, and those overlap um, you know, quite a bit for folks and are very similar roles depending on the company. But when we combined the the content answers, so hiring for a content marketer or hiring for a content development person, whether it's a writer or a video or whatever, um, those combine to over 70%. Um, so more people are hiring a content focused role than anything else mm-hmm. over the next year. Definitely. And I think that's a reflection of, of scaling your team. So if you are scaling a team from one to two or from two to four social marketers um, or people in your social marketing team, you're more likely to scale on the content side than you are on the social media manager side, mm-hmm. um, because it's it's hard to it's hard to use software or use process to uh, improve the uh, efficiency of your content creation. You yeah. typically just have to hire more people or hire an agency or a vendor if you want to write more or create more video. It's it's usually a one to one scenario, whereas. A community manager, social media manager, they can be scaled more easily with software and with process. So, yes. um, as as we see social teams build out, I think the majority of that uh, growth is going to be content focused roles. I agree. And to your point, I mean, scaling that takes humans. It's you can't automate the yeah. creation of content unless you want to look like a spam bot, and then you know we could argue you really can't even do it then. And so uh, we're seeing the same thing, and and you know that's an area we're investing in, and it has to be people who understand the difference between content writing and content marketing. 
right? Understanding that they're writing for a purpose and how does this integrate into the overall goals and objectives? And yeah, and, and it's really, I think it's hard to hire mm-hmm. um, content folks or just social media in general, finding that we ask people if it's difficult to find qualified candidates for social media roles and 80% said yes. Yeah. I mean, that shows you the difficulty. It, it's hard to find that that type of talent right now, especially the content side, I think. It really is. And I think that, you know, there's some solid people out there and we snag them (laughs) and try to keep them close when we can. But there are a lot of people that so many things are just changing so fast. Right. And I think that there's some people who they may know some things, um, you know, what they knew two years ago and then they go and work for a company and they almost fall behind. Right. And so it's like it's so important, I believe, for people who want to stay and work in this space that you have to put in the hours outside of your day job to to understand what's happening. Yeah. And and you have to look for the people that are self teachers, yes. people that um, are able to be multidisciplinary, that look at a Snapchat or look at a Pinterest and can figure it out to a yes. certain extent um, rather than getting stuck and just throwing their hands up. So I'm saying, I don't know this, like who's going to teach me this? Yeah. It's like, no. Those are two different reactions <laughs> and one of them is very beneficial to your business and, and the other is, is, a, is a struggle and it's going to force you to hire more people. Yeah, absolutely. So we have the acronym GSD, get stuff done. And we often say the other word that I won't say here, but yes. <laughs> that's our hashtag. Get, For sure, yeah. I mean, get it that's done. The, that's the mindset. Figure it out. Do it the same way I would do it, right? If I don't know something, I'm going to go research and figure it out. Yeah. So like another big, not to jump ahead in the report, mm-hmm. but another big uh, finding was video. Um, we asked people what they're creating at least once a month when it comes to types of content. Mm-hmm. And video shocked me. It came in at close to 50%, the yeah. third most... Um, 46%. Yeah. It's 46%, almost, almost half. Um, and it's showed up number three on the list behind images and blog posts. So, I mean, video is important. It's a big trend. Um, all you have to do is look at the, what I would say are the big three social networks right now. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And all of them are emphasizing video in Mm -hmm. their algorithms of Mm -hmm. what shows up. Right. Um, Instagram even has a whole tab dedicated to video now. So it's, it's clearly a focus for everyone for, for many reasons. Um, but I did not realize that social marketers were kind of on that trend so heavily. Um, mm-hmm. and I think there's several things impacting that from Snapchat to live streaming, um, you know, videos becoming a larger, more diverse category, but that's another example of a place where people have to really learn it. Like to do video well, it, you have to learn a few new skill sets. Um, and most marketers don't have those skill sets. You know, the number of video people in a, inside of a company is usually one or less. Exactly. Um, so that's a place where a really good example of what we're talking about, if, if you don't have people that are willing to kind of jump out of their comfort zone and learn how to produce video for Snapchat or video for live stream or video for Facebook ads or Instagram ads, um, you know, you're going to be paying for that in a right. different way somehow. I agree. Now, what do you think is driving the push and the investment of video? And I won't tell you what I think first. I'll listen okay. to you first. <laughs> uh, well, I think video is a more human um, mm-hmm. connection. It's emotional. Um, it's the closest to reality, so we connect with it in a, in a stronger way. Um, it's it's a moving picture, you know. So it's the animated GIF effect of of autoplay video now. Um, where it draws your eye immediately, much quicker yes. than a static image or text for the most part. Um, it's not a cure-all, but it's got a lot of those things working for it um, that make it more engaging and can really hold your your time and your attention. Absolutely. It's, it's the reason, you know, it's the same reason why TV commercials are the biggest spend when it comes to marketers mm-hmm. and advertising uh, because it's the biggest opportunity to connect in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, you know, what we're seeing and I talked with you a little bit about this the other day with video is even with with small and large business and that I am so happy to see it becoming more raw, right? And I grew up in the day working big corporate and where I can remember working video, you know, with our C-level executives and it having to just be perfect and like you would have to edit it, you know, a hundred times to get one word right and driving my agencies crazy at the time. Now, I think that you know, businesses of all sizes are feeling pressure to do video. And I think, and I agree with everything you said, by the way, too, the humanization aspect of it and the engagement aspect of it. But I also think that, you know, one little thing too of Facebook rewarding right now organically um, video is making people really look at it. 
right? And when they know they they can post a video or a live video and they're getting the engagement, their confidence is going up, right? Yeah. And I'm, sure. I'm loving it. Like I'm seeing people that when we first start working with them, they're like, well, I don't know, maybe we can do video. But as soon as we say, let's just try it, like let's just film this live, you know, behind the scenes. And as soon as they do it, they see the reaction. I get chills talking about this because this is this is what I love more than anything is empowering people. Right. And when they yeah. s- they see that instant result of, the, of somebody actually watching their video, it's like they liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and they yeah. shared it and yeah, I can I boost that post or, you know, do something with it from a, a ad perspective. And Facebook is really going to reward me for that. Right. That's powerful right now. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's the human aspect. I mm-hmm. think, you know, it's easier to produce video than ever. Um, it's, I, I think you're right. It's, uh, there's less pressure on a producing video that is super polished, mm-hmm. um, because of live streaming, because of Snapchat, um, because of the growth of video as a platform, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to have the best lighting, makeup, and and sound team to, to produce a, a great video anymore. You just have to have a confident person mm-hmm. uh, with a you know a little transparency and a like relatable message um, that's actually invested in a conversation with an audience, and it works works pretty well. Yeah. I agree. So exciting. So anything else on, I know infographics was on the list. That's, those are pretty powerful too, if done right. Yeah. We saw a lot of, again, a lot of niche things that showed up that I think are, you know, Mm -hmm. we'll we'll know more of this next year when we have, uh, when we can build off from the baseline to see if there's any growth. Mm -hmm. My suspicions are that, uh, content types like white papers, uh, slide share webinars, um, infographics, that those are pretty static. Mm -hmm. Um, and pretty niche to either B2B or BD brands or certain industries, right? right? And I think those are successful for folks that, you know, you can't invest in all of these things. You can't mm-hmm. invest in a podcast and, you know, constantly do surveys and webinars and slideshare decks and white papers unless you're like IBM or something. Exactly. Um, so I think, you know, pick one or two or three of these and invest in them if you know that they're going to work for you, if you've tested them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, infographics is one of those things that works. I think mm-hmm. PR teams especially are, are focused on those. Um, I think a lot of B2B companies use those really well. And they can be solid kind of entry um, lead generation engines for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I always, you know, tell our clients and uh, create a couple more key pieces of content. Right. And where you can break that into to different sound bites. Right. Create once and use many. And so come up with a couple marquee, you know, stories or, or yeah. educational pieces, kind of like what you did with this report. Right. What you did with the future of social marketing report. I mean, how many different blog posts and conversations and podcasts and um, videos you could do off of this one report. Right. I could take, you know, I'm a geek with this stuff and I love it. So, but you could take one of these slides and you know, you could have five different uh, content assets that you spin off from there. Yeah. I call it, I call it vanilla ice content. So it's, it's, it's intentionally doing a one hit wonder where you create one big piece of content that's (laughs) really successful. I see you you dancing to this. (laughs) (laughs) You just keep living off of it for the rest of your life. Right. (laughs) Exactly. All right. So then, um, the one last thing I want to touch on is around influencer marketing. So I know that um, it's touched on in the report and uh, it was pretty clear that people are uh, depending on agencies for that. It's still, you know, compelling in many industries, but that it seems that they're not way, they're not spending a lot of time internally doing that because it's because of a lot of the logistics and laws. Yeah. Or there was a lot of overlap where there was some agency report, Mm -hmm. uh, some agency support. So I think Influencer marketing and social advertising were the two most likely things to be outsourced yeah. um, by brand teams um, from in-house to out, outside of the company, uh, whether that's a contractor or an agency or, or mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and I think both are similar to where they're not. There's not a lot of skill set that's replicated from influencer marketing yeah. to most of the social marketing tactics. Uh, right. Same with social advertising. So it helps to have an outside expert uh, or have a team of outside experts. So an influencer marketing, I think, is even more complex than social marketing because it takes several things. You have to you have to find influencers, which is a new task, uh, a research heavy task that's hard. Um, you have to vet them, which is a very specific task. You know, I think maybe PR companies might be good at that. Mm-hmm. Um, but traditionally, social marketing teams are not, um, you know, necessarily 
versed in that um, very well. Then you have to maintain relationships with them over a long period or a short campaign. Yeah. Um, and then you have to kind of measure that success, which is a different type of measurement than, than most content. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of pieces of influencer marketing that are difficult and might not exist in your organization as an expertise yet. So I think that's why it's outsourced more often than not. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, in, you know, in certain industries, it's obviously an ongoing thing that's needed constantly. But in some industries and in different businesses, it can be campaigns, right? So particularly like in the B2B space, they may have a couple events they're doing per year, and then they need to really, you know, gear it up there. And the the work that they outsource um, for that project can be leveraged throughout the year. And then the agency, yeah. you know, because we've even done that. And then where we come back in six months later, but we've laid the groundwork and then they're able to manage some of those things in between. So I was, I was just, I was interested to hear that. And I'm actually happy to see that that's how brands are managing it. Um, yeah, I think it helps. I think mm-hmm. agencies are are better at influencer marketing or mm-hmm. vendors that focus on influencer marketing because it's something that you really should specialize at. Because yeah. um, it can think, really hurt your brand. I mean, and that's the thing, you know, yeah. we, it can, the way you reach out to influencers can really, really end up doing you more harm than good if you're not careful. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And, and I think, you know, it's it's going to be something that more brands want to do mm-hmm. moving forward as, as, algorithm, as algorithms start to drive every major social network uh, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, they're all adopting some type of algorithm. It's harder to get organic results. Mm-hmm. So we're going to have to turn to, you know, paid methodologies to get content viewed by mm-hmm. the specific audiences w- that we want to get in front of. And that's social advertising, that's partnerships, that's influencer marketing. Awesome. Those are going to be some of the answers to that problem. Awesome. All right. So this is good data, Jason. This is awesome. So anything else you want to add? On the data side, and um, I you know just take a look. I, I think we saw Instagram uh, clearly trending up. We mm-hmm. saw video clearly trending up. I think download the report um, and take a look if you're interested. We have a lot of blog posts on socialfresh.com, and there's several other companies that have blogged about it as well, from Firebrand Group to Simply Measured to a lot of coverage that we got, which is awesome. Uh, but there's some good stats in here. I think people should just be aware of. There's some great expert commentary from you know people at Microsoft and JBear and other smart folks. And I think it's worth just kind of giving yourself a baseline and reviewing it. Okay. And we will make sure that we put everything you've talked about on the show notes page for this episode. And this is episode 212. So people can go to socialzoomfactor.com slash 212. Um, you can check out the conference website, socialfreshconference.com. We've got a great lineup of speakers this year and sponsors that I think are, are really exciting. We've got Mitch Joel. Uh, the Weather Channel is going to be there. The CMO of HubSpot, Peter Shankman, will be there. We've got the Red Cross, uh, Fresh Direct, Spotify, The Economist, Remax. Twitter is going to speak. Uh, Century 21. I could go on and on and on. Um, we've got a really great lineup. And we're going to be talking about a lot of these topics like Snapchat and live streaming and Instagram and social advertising that are really important and changing very rapidly. Uh, we've got the experts from all over the world uh, on stage to, to kind of give you their expertise and their best practices. I can't wait. Yeah. And I'll put a redirect link to you can go to socialzoomfactor.com slash social fresh. And then that will get you to where you can register for the event and save $100. So perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jason, for joining us and blessing us with your knowledge and um, everything that you have to offer. I I wish you incredible success with the event coming up. Awesome. Thanks for uh, having me on, Pam. It was a great time. I really appreciated talking to you. Thank you so much. If you're ready to Zoom your business and Zoom your life, then don't let the end of this episode be the end of your journey. Visit socialzoomfactor.com slash zoom for incredible free resources and guides. And be sure to join the Social Zoom Factor mailing list so you never miss an episode. We'll see you next time on Social Zoom Factor.